welcome once again to the presentation this uh, Sabbath uh, afternoon. We are continuing with our series on uh, justification by faith. And uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, I'd like to welcome to our viewing and listening number 12, where we are dealing with uh, the history of uh, Minneapolis 1888. And uh, I'll be focusing on the issue in uh, the law in uh, Galatians. This was one of the controversies that uh, 1888 conferentation experience when the Lord sent his message through Elders Wagona and uh, Eti Jones. And so I welcome everyone to our viewing and uh, I'd like just to pray as uh, we start this presentation. I'd like us to pray as we start the presentation. Abba Father in heaven, thank you so much for thy grace which is sufficient when we need it. Thank you for your love and thank you for your mercies. And Lord, as we look into your word, we pray that uh, the sanctifying influence may be, Lord, received in our hearts that we may walk in all righteousness. And so guide us in this time, take charge of the feeble instruments that we may be able to communicate clearly unto our souls and to thy people in Jesus' name, amen. And so there were issues at stake in uh, Minneapolis, 1888. And uh, we find that uh, selfishness has been uh, the root cause of uh, many things that people suffer. We are told that selfishness is seen, all selfishness is seen. And this is the spirit that ruled Minneapolis. So we go a little bit into history because I have been covering the history of Minneapolis and uh, the results of uh, these fractions that were there. And today we continue in this wonderful history because the greatest theft that uh, a person, the greatest robbery that can ever happen to a nation is uh, the robbery of their identity. And this is the situation that uh, we find ourselves in as Seventh-day Adventists. We have been robbed of our identity, our history. But the history of Adventism helps us to know where we have failed and how we can rectify things. So let us try to enter behind the curtains and see what was happening in this conference in 1888. And I know that uh, the Lord will bless us as we go through this. The issue of the law in Galatians. Look at uh, at that time, the president of the general conference, G.I. Butler, was sick. And uh, if you read the history, Sister White says that he was sick because of the arguments that were going on and the spirit that was prevailing at that time and what he stood for. And fearing that uh, Others were bringing in things that uh, 
will do away with the law and bring the church in disrepute. Brothers Wagner and Eti Jones that they were not on the right track. And so he was homesick. And this is what he handed over to his uh, supporters that came into the conference to be signed by Brother Jones and Brother Wagner. Number one, he wrote, resolved the law in Galatians is ceremonial law. This is G.I. Butler. And it was signed by Iowa Conference President G.H. Morrison. And then G.I. Butler at home wrote, resolved the law in Galatians is the, ceremony, is the moral law. And it was to be signed by Elder Wagner and A.T. Jones who are saying that the law in Galatians is moral law. And so enter in Sister White then. She said in this scripture in Galatians 3, the Holy Spirit through the apostle is speaking a special of the moral law. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee to him for pardon and peace. So you find that uh, Sister White was differing with the, the general conference president, G.I. Butler, on the law in Galatians. And that is what Elder Wagner and Eti Jones were really preaching. But we will see what is so important about this law in Galatians. So I continues in 1888 messages, page 186, paragraph one. This is our history. Dear brother Haley, I have not had a very time, easy time since I left the Pacific coast. Our first meeting was not like any other general conference I ever attended. The thought that some of our brethren ventured to entertain some ideas contrary to those of the leading brethren fill the minds of some of our brethren with such a prejudice that they could not with any fairness even come to an investigation of the position of our faith with anything like Christian feelings. It was more after the order developed by the priests and rulers and Pharisees in the days of Christ. Because I came from the Pacific they would have it that I had been influenced by Willie White, Dr. Wagner, and A.T. Jones. Continued on, the message of the Lord says, Brother Butler wrote me a letter of most singular purpose and made wonderfully strong statement in it. He called this man whom God has appointed to do a special work in his cause fledglings. He moreover said that he had received letters from Northern and Central California saying that they will not send their children to the college if the views of E.J. Wagner and E.T. Jones were brought in. What are these views? The law in Galatians and the theme of righteousness by faith. We want to look at the law in Galatians. This is introductory part, 1888 Minneapolis conference. Well, I will not attempt to tell you all about this matter. But I learned that you are on one on who you are. But I learned that you are one who wrote letters of warning to Elder Butler. I asked him if I might see the letter, but he said that he had destroyed it. Strange proceedings, my brother. Is the Lord leading you, or is it the enemy working upon your mind as upon the minds of others? I have come to the conclusion that this is the case. So these people are being worked on not by God but by Satan. I have not changed my views in reference to the law in Galatians, but I hope that I shall never be left to entertain the spirit that was brought into the conference, general conference. I have not the least hesitancy in saying it was not the spirit of God. If every idea we have entertained in doctrines is truth, will not the truth bear to be investigated? Will it totter and fall if criticized? If so, let it, let, let if fall, the sooner, the better. The spirit that will close the door to investigation of points of truth in a Christ-like man is not the spirit from above. So whichever the points of doctrine that we may be having, if they are not led by the spirit of Christ, and he says that if these ideas on the law of Galatians be as you people say, then may the Lord save me from your ideas on the law of Galatians. 
for the people who are saying that the law in Galatians is ceremonial law. She continues, you wrote that plans were all laid and that at Jonas, Dr. Wagner and Willie White had things all prepared to make a drive at the general conference. And you won Elder Butler, a poor sick man, broken in body and in mind to prepare for the emergency. And what? In that conference, Elder Butler felt called upon to send in telegrams and long letters. Stand by the old landmarks, just as though the Lord was not present at that conference and will not keep his hand on the work. My testimony was ignored and never in my life experience was I treated as at that conference. And I give you my brother with some others of our brethren the credit of doing what you could do to bring this state of affairs about. You may have thought that you were verily doing good service, but it served the cause of enemy rather than the cause of God, the law in Galatians. E.J. Wagoner, series of nine articles in the science in which he claimed that the law in Galatians is the moral law. While the older brethren were holding that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. And then we have this history given by Jadison Sylvanus Washburn. Listen to what the controversy is all about when they are controverting on the points of the law in, Gal in Galatians. Judson Sylvanus Washburn says, so I went to have a visit with her, that is E.G. White in her tent at Ottawa meeting. I told her I had always thought and believed that she was a prophet, but I was disturbed by the Minneapolis episode. I had thought that Uriah Smith and J.H. Morrison were right, meaning that they that held to the law in Galatians being the ceremonial law, Washburn thought that they were right and Sister White was wrong. Do you know why J.H. Morrison left the conference early, Sister White asked J.H. Washburn. I replied, yes. Then she told me just what Morrison had said to me and the revelation of her apparently superhuman knowledge of that private confidential conversation frightened me. I realized that here was one who knew secrets. Sister White told me of her guide in Europe who had stretched his hands out and said, there are mistakes being made on both sides in this controversy, whether on H. Jones, Wagoner, or the brothers G.I. Butler, J.H. Morrison, and Uriah Smith, who are of the ceremonial law. Then she added that the law in Galatians is not the real issue of the conference. Now get that, because people have made a large issue on this law of Galatians in 1888 as it were. But she's saying, this is not the real issue about the law in Galatians. And this is what we are looking at. The real issue is righteousness by faith. E.J. Wagner can teach righteousness by faith more clearly than I can, said Sister White. Why, Sister White? J.H. Washburn said. Do you mean to say that E.J. Wagner can teach it better than you can with all your experience? Sister White replied, yes, the Lord has given him special light on that question. I have been wanting to bring it out more clearly, but I could not have brought it out as clearly as he did. But when he brought it out at Minneapolis, I recognized it. This was the most humbling statements that you could find from the prophet of the Lord, that somebody who's just an elder, a younger person in the ministry, had been given and entrusted the light on a subject that she had been teaching for 45 years. And the people were not understanding it. But now it was so brought out clearly this is the experience, brothers and sisters, we need as a people who are propagating the truth of this time. Such a humbling spirit and a spirit of conversion, even if we know something, there can be somebody whom Christ has given the message in clear tones and can be understood by the people. What we lack is humility and self-rules, and that is why we are still having troubles, and we are still in this world. So, I went to have a visit with her in her tent at the Ottawa meeting. I told her I had always thought she believed in this. And uh, it, it comes out clearly that uh, E.G. Wagona had been given the message for the people. And so let us look at this law in Galatians and what is it all about and these things to do with the righteousness by faith. And so when you look at the whole book of Galatians, Paul 
speaks about um, him giving the gospel to the people. And he talks about if even an angel came with another gospel that lets someone who comes with such a message be accursed. And he talks about the people who wanted to compel him even to circumcise Timothy and uh, Titus and the others and how Peter was carried about with this Judaism and all that stuff and rebukes Peter. And then he reaches in Galatians chapter three where the Galatians are now resorting to works rather than continuing in faith. And so let us look at this thing so closely and how it applies to righteousness by faith and how the older brethren could not understand what was being spoken of in Galatians. So Galatians 1.6, says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. As we have found out in uh, our previous sessions by uh, Brother Eric, uh, Brother Brian, and uh, Brother Zadok, is that uh, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, and the just shall live by faith. And so Paul talks to Galatians that he marveled that they have been removed from the gospel, which he had been given unto them. What is your lamentation, Brother Paul? He says, uh, Galatians 1, 7, which is not another, the gospel that was being brought. And uh, we looked at uh, the different gospels in the last Sabbath, where actually we had uh, universalism, we have uh, evangel evangelical gospel. We have many Armenian gospel, Calvinism. These are the things that were being brought in the church of Galatia. And so he says that these are not a gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble and will pervert the gospel of Christ. And the gospel of Christ is the power unto salvation and the just shall live by faith. Brother Paul continues to say, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say, I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And what is the gospel? The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, which comes with the power of victory over sin. Paul in his discourse continues the problem in Galatia, Galatians chapter four, verse nine. But now after that, you have known God or rather are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So whichever gospel that was being brought in Galatia was not the gospel of liberation but was a gospel that was going to plunge the children of God in bondage as even the Pharisees were in bondage and they could not fulfill the law of God. Let us look at uh, how the Jewish people themselves stumbled in the book of uh, Romans. Romans. It talks about how the Gentiles who had uh, followed after the gospel. That is in Romans chapter nine, verses, um, verses um, from verses 30. Romans chapter nine, verses 30. Look at what the law, the word of God says. That uh, what shall we say that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? I'm reading from Romans chapter 9 from verses 30. Verses 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. 
So the gospel was this tumbling rock of offense, which is Jesus Christ. And all those who will believe on him will be saved. But Israel pursued it as if it were by the works of the law. And this is what the children of Galatia were resorting after starting in faith, they started resorting or they started going back to what we call the works of the law and thinking that in them, salvation can be merited upon them. But now after you have known God or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements where unto you desire again to be in bondage. And the people who have ever thought of pleasing God, the law requires the keeping of it and righteousness that it produces. But the law itself cannot produce the righteous in, righteousness in man. The law must be bound in Christ. And when you receive Christ and his life, then you have received the law and you can walk in, in it. Think, talking about Jesus Christ, and uh, I'd like to give this example. The law has to be preached in Christ. The law has to be hidden in Christ. And when we receive him, we receive all the righteousness of the law and in him, we can be able to keep it. Christ is the husband of the church. Christ is the husband, if I may say. And what is the importance of the husband? The importance of the husband or a husband is to house the band that is under him. And so the house band is like a ring that hedges the people inside it from any harm that is outside of it. And so Christ as the husband of the church has bound us in himself and his law in him has protected us from all evils. It gives us the boundaries in which we cannot go. And so if we are in the house band, then we can be able to keep the law because he is the one surrounding us in, in him is the fullness of the protection. And so as a bride, when we are housed or husband by the bridegroom, then in him, we can have freedom and liberations from what bondage or the bondage that the Galatians were entering in. And so we have to take Christ in for us to be able to keep his law. Ye did run well, Galatians 5, 7. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And so by going back to these beggarly elements, they were not even able to continue obeying the truth because they started looking for righteousness by the works of the law instead of seeking it in the rock of ages, having Christ in, then they continue in those things that they have received. Paul continues in his discourse. And uh, the cause of problem in Galatia, what was the cause of the problem in Galatia? We find it in Galatians chapter two, verse four. And remember we are talking this problem in Galatia, the law in Galatia in a uh, view of 1888 messages and the controversies there, the older brethren refusing the law of Galatians to be moral and ceremonial, but standing with the ceremonial, while Elder um, Wagona and Jonas were saying that it is moral law. And the whole issue was about justification by faith, righteousness by faith, as we have seen Washburn say. It revolved around, around having Christ inside so that they may be able to walk and to continue in the things they had received. So when they left Christ outside, we shall see that in Galatians chapter three, they left even the power to be able to keep that law. What is the problem in Galatia? Galatians chapter two, verse four. And that because of false brethren and awareness brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So brethren came in unaware, continued on. In Minneapolis, 1888, second day's proceeding at 9 a.m., Elder E.J. Wagner gave another lesson on the law and the gospel. In this lesson, the first and second chapters of Galatians in connection with Acts 15, and you remember the 
Acts 15 is about uh, the controversy in Jerusalem where the Gentiles were being converted and Paul, wa Paul was there telling the brethren that accept the gospel. You don't have to be in the bondage of the ceremonial laws of the Jewish people. And after a much dispute, they came back to the brethren and they reported it. And then James arose and spoke in that conference in Acts chapter 15. So we read on. In this lesson, the first and second chapters of Galatians in connection with Acts 15 were partially represented by him to show that the same harmony existed there as elsewhere, that the key to the book was justification by faith in Christ Jesus, amen. So when you are reading Acts chapter 15 and the dispute of the conference in Acts chapter 15, and you are reading Galatians, know that the controversy you are dealing with are the controversy to do with justification by faith and righteousness by faith. With the emphasis on the letter word, in Christ, that liberty in Christ was always freedom from sin and that separation from Christ to some other means of justification always brought bondage. So uh, what we are talking about is brothers and sisters that uh, if you leave Christ out and you will want to work out the law of God, what you are entering in is bondage and not liberation and freedom in Christ. And you will not be able to fulfill the righteousness of the law because Christ is uh, the end of the law uh, in those who believe in the gospel, in those who believe in him. And so this is the problem that was in Galatia. We continue. It's good to read this history to understand what was happening in uh, Minneapolis actually. We are told, he stated incidentally that the law of Moses and the law of God were not distinct terms as applied to the ceremonial and moral laws and cited Numbers 15, 22, 24, and Luke 2, 23 to 24 as proof. He closed at 10, 15 by asking those present to capture, compare Acts 15, 7 to 11 with Romans 3, 20 to 25. I hope you are getting, you have your pen and your papers and you are writing down this. The notes are available, we will provide them. You can review the sermon again on my timeline. We shall be uploading it on, face, uh, on YouTube also so that you may go through these things and be able to ascertain if these things are so. Appeals were made by Brother Wagner and Sister White to the brethren, old and young, to seek God, put away all spirit of prejudice and opposition and strive to come into the unit of faith in the bonds of brotherly love. So Sister White was urging the brethren to remove preconceived ideas and then come to the Philadelphian condition, brotherly love, which will even be able to make Christ come and harvest his church. On Friday, October 19, 1888, at 9 p.m. a.m., Elder Wagner continued his lessons on the law and gospel. The scripture considered were the 15th chapter of Acts and the second and third of Galatians, compared with Romans chapter four and other passages in Romans. His purpose was to show that the real point of controversy was justification by faith in Christ, which faith is reckoned to us as to Abraham for righteousness, the covenant and promises to Abraham are the covenant and promises to us. And when you go through the book of uh, Romans chapter four, the controversy is there. Was Abraham justified after circumcision or circumcision was a sign of justification? So was he circumcised as a means of acceptance or circumcision was a sign that he had been accepted in Christ. And we find that circumcision came after the promise had been made to him and his seed. Circumcision comes after. And uh, as brother Eric was saying in the afternoon, uh, in the midday session, that uh, uh, the fruit is not the gift itself. We are given love itself precedes the commandment keeping. Commandment keeping is a result of you having that love in your heart. This is the, the main thing. And so circumcision came as just a sign that he had been accepted in Christ, but people put the cart before the horse. And this is the issue in uh, the book of Galatians. 
continued on, on Wednesday, October 23, a series of instructive lectures has been given on justification by faith by Elder E.J. Wagoner. The closing one was given this morning with the foundation principles all are agreed, but there are some differences in regard to the interpretation of several passages. The lectures have tended to a more thorough investigation of truth, amen. And it is hoped that the unity of the faith will be reached on this important question. And so when you look at uh, 1888 in a general sense, what is missing is brotherly love, Philadelphia, the agape love that is forbearing, that is patience. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This agape love, the agape love that um, could not raise itself, the agape love that uh, considered others more important than yourself was missing. Brethren thought that they were a more voice than they were, they had more authority than the others when even it came to investigation of truth. The same disease we have even today. An opportunity was given for both Jonas and Wagner to respond. And when the time came, they stood up front side by side with open Bibles. Alternating in the reading of 16 Bible passages, primarily from the book of Romans and Galatians. This was their only answer. And without a word of comment, they took their seats. During the entire time of the reading, there was a hushed stillness over the vast assembly. The Bible spoke for itself. This is the return of the latter rain by Ron Dunfield, uh, page 135, 136. And if you, you don't have this book, please conduct me. I'll uh, be able to send you a soft copy in PDF. It's a wonderful book on 1888. So when uh, Brothers Wagner and E.J. Uh, Eti Jones were accused of preaching error, and uh, doing away with the law of God in 1888 Minneapolis conference and were given a chance to defend themselves. They didn't go into disputes that we go in Trinity versus non-Trinitarian and all this stuff that we, we throw about. The brethren held their Bibles in the hand and stood and read the Bible and without a comment, they sat down. Such a, a spirit of meekness like their savior in such a session where actually we miss it a lot in our discussions. In fact, I can say that uh, many a times in this um, present age that we are living in, we do not have discussions. What we have are disputes and debates. And so when you enter into debates and uh, when you enter into disputations, the spirit of Christ is withdrawn. The angels of God fold their wings, we are told, and they go back. They, they, they are not allowed to work on the hearts of men because the angels of God do not uh, enter into the, uh, the debates. And so what we should be having are discussions which build each other in brotherly love rather than disputations of this and that. And this is what was lacking in Minneapolis 1888. And that is why the message was not received as God intended it to be received, as we shall see. We should be able to check in the spirit that we are working with brothers and sisters, lest we repeat the history of Minneapolis. And I said that the greatest robbery that can ever happen to a church, it is identity theft. If we do not know our history, where we are coming from, what has happened and where we are standing in, in such a time as this, we will just repeat the same mistakes while yet say that we are standing for the Lord. And so, a comparison was made of these chapters during that discourse, the Galatians chapter one and chapter two, Acts chapter 15, Numbers chapter 15, Luke chapter two, Acts chapter 15, again, Romans chapter three. All this that you're seeing on the screen, Galatians chapter two, three, Romans chapter four, and then uh, uh, the Galatians chapter one, all these were looked into to ascertain what these scriptures was talking about. And you will have all this, uh, I'm passing through the history and we cannot capture everything and read everything at such a time as this, but just giving you the glimpses. So same problem as that of Acts, the problem that was in Galatia, how people are justified is the same problem that had, was in the book of Acts chapter 15. And that is why Wagona and Jonas were comparing the book of Acts chapter 15 in the book of Galatians. What was the problem 
in the book of Acts at the conference in Jerusalem. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the man of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Remember Paul talking about the brethren who came unaware in Galatia and started teaching another gospel, which was not a gospel. This is the same thing that was in the book of Acts chapter 15 at that conference in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 15, verse five, we read, but there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Acts chapter 15, verse 24, for so much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such a commandment. Luther on Galatians, that it was not enough for the Galatians to believe in Christ or to be baptized, but that it was needful to circumcise them. Remember the statement in Galatians chapter three, verse one, you foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you? Did you receive the righteousness of Christ by obeying the law or you still received it by faith? So Luther has to ponder upon what is happening in Galatia. Was it, how did their righteousness come about? That it was not enough for the Galatians to believe in Christ. Now they had started the walk in believing in Christ, but now that is not enough. And they didn't just go as far as being baptized, but that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. For except you be circumcised after the man of Moses, you cannot be saved. As though Christ was a workman who had begun a building and left it to Moses to finish it. What an irony. We are told in the book of uh, Philippians chapter one, verse six, that he who has started the good work in you shall bring it to accomplishment even in the day of God or the day of Christ. So this Galatians started with Christ. And they want to end with Moses. Christ started. That is how we even behave today. Some people, uh, we start with Christ, but uh, we have to finish up with son. We have to finish up with somebody else. We have to let other things happen in our lives so that we may be accepted in Christ. But uh, this cannot be so. The issue of circumcision. The issue of circumcision as a pretext for salvation was the main contention. But seeing that circumcision is nothing, then the issue was really the works of the law as means of salvation. First Corinthians 7, 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. So Paul says, and in Acts chapter 15, verse 30, issue clear that Jerusalem canceled. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch and when they had gathered at the multitude together, they delivered the episode. What did it say? Which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And every time this message of righteousness by faith and justification is presented, I tell you, this is how we feel it. It brings rejoicing and consolation not because it has freed us from the law, but it has freed us from the condemnation and the power of sin in our lives, knowing that Christ is our sin bearer and in him we walk and we live. This is the message that the Lord intended the church to receive and find consolation in it. But the enemy of soul has been robbing it of its power by bringing in suppositions bringing in his own elements so that the people of God may not get victor over sin. And they are left on their own to struggle to try to please God when our righteousness is filthy rags and only in Christ are we accepted in heaven. The delegation that met at that famous Jerusalem conference of Acts chapter 15 came to a spirit-led decision on this matter. But it, it just goes to show that false brethren will always arise to fuel their views to take away the liberty of the gospel. And what is the gospel? The power of God unto salvation. Genesis chapter 17, verse 11, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So the issue of circumcision, 
we found that circumcision was a token to show that God had made a covenant with his people. As even we are able to continue in obedience to the law because of the covenant of love and peace we have entered in with Jesus Christ. It is after entering into this covenant, after God accepting us in his son and saying that ye are mine, then we are given this token, the power to obey. First of all, is the power, freedom from iniquity and sin, and then the power of obedience. The raw, the, 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 these wheels start rolling in our lives once we enter into the covenant with Christ. It was a sign of the faith in the new covenant that was given to Abraham. And that new covenant is the everlasting gospel, the everlasting covenant. The just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 9, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And we can speak about the Gentiles and the savages whom Christ puts his spirit and grace in them that they can entertain even the missionaries, even though they have never had even a law in their lives. The spirit of Christ working in them. And we have found out that some people can be even more perfect in the sight of God than the law keepers because the law keepers crucified Jesus Christ himself. And so what is the motivation of what you do, what you do? This is something that should be looked into Romans chapter four, verse 10. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? These issues of justification by faith. Was it my dress that made Christ accept me? Was it my diet that made him accept me? Or did he shed his blood before even I knew about him? And I was imputed righteousness and I have to accept him. I have to believe in him and in him I'm accepted. And therein lies the power to overcome sin. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. These are the issues, the cracks, the matters that has to do with justification by faith. The message has been hidden to the church. Romans chapter four, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So the righteousness by faith, this covenant, he had received it before, yet before circumcision, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Before any man can do anything before God, he is accepted in his son. Such a wonderful gospel that if it could be preached to the church, they will see the loveliness of God and his son, and they'll be able to go all the way with him rather than pointing fingers and uh, condemnation. In fact, what is Christianity? I, I, I like to show you what is really Christianity because we have missed the whole issue of what is Christianity. What is Christianity? Bear with me as I put it on the screen. What does it all entail? This thing that we call Christianity. Some people or some of us do not understand it so well and we have walked in darkness for so long but God is calling us unto his marvelous light. Listen to last day events. Page 90, paragraph 5, taken from Testimonies to the Church, volume 6, page 397. Christianity is not manifested in pugilistic accusations and condemnations. And this is, we go outside there and uh, we say that we are preaching the gospel. And all we have is pugilistic accusations and condemnations. And we think this can bring people to salvation. We employ uh, fear-mongering tactics and misrepresent who God is and his character. It is the misapprehension of God's character that has pushed the people away from Christ and make them atheists and pagans. This is not Christianity. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, but we have missed the whole thing. And so Paul continues with his discourse to the Galatians and uh, to the people of uh, Galatia. 
he says, Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a result of faith that he had before being circumcised and that faith was counted for righteousness. Circumcision was only a sign of the possession of or righteousness. And when righteousness was wanting, the circumcision amounted to nothing. So if you don't have Christ in you, it doesn't matter how many commandments you keep. Remember that rich young fool telling Jesus that I have kept this since my childhood. And then Christ tells him, looks at him lovingly and tells him, young man, go sell what you have and give to the poor and then come and follow me. Pure religion, James 1, 27. And the young man looks at Jesus very sadly because he had many uh, uh, riches and walks away. And Christ looks at him again lovingly and tell, turns to his disciples and tells him, surely I tell you verily, it is easy for a camel to go through the needle than the rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The same rich young fool who had kept the 10 commandments now is found wanting in the law of loving the neighbor as you love yourself. He thought that the law was about negation and not the positivity of the law. He thought that by not, um, by not uh, abusing the neighbor, by not committing adultery, by not doing these things, he was keeping the law. But one thing was wanting, the loving of his neighbor by sharing what he had. And Christ says, this is not righteousness. We keep the law as it was a composition, but Christ not in the heart, it amounts to nothing. We're gonna on the gospel in Galatians. And this leads to the main point, namely that the mere act of circumcision never made the Jewish gods peculiar people. Circumcision never made these people peculiar before the nations. Other nations were doing even extreme things more than circumcision. They were making their children pass into the fire for Molech. The people were throwing their children on the wall to die for circumcision. In other denominations, we passed through more rigorous things than even just going on church on Sabbath to show that we are in Christ. And so circumcision cannot be amounted as righteousness. There is something more to circumcision and keeping the law. They were his peculiar people only when they had that of which circumcision was the sign, namely righteousness, Christ in him, in them, the hope of glory. When they did not have that, they were just the same as though they had never been and were cut off without mercy as readily as were the heathen. You see the controversy in the book of Galatians in 1888, Wagona continues, circumcision was only a sign of the position of righteousness and when righteousness was wanting, the circumcision amounted to nothing. And then he says, like the Jewish, who much emphasis is placed on the symbol with absolute neglect to what it actually represents. Deuteronomy 10, 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff naked. The Lord will want us to have him. Having righteousness within produces righteousness without. But we, we, we are accustomed to symbols. We are accustomed to being seen in the world outside rather than actually letting what is inside. With many the shell of the nut without the kernel comes for more than the kernel without the shell. We're gonna in glad tidings. Many of the Israelites regarded the sacrificial service as having in itself virtue to set them free from sin. You, you start seeing the problem in Galatia and the Jewish and what they were prescribing to Galatians. God desired to teach them that it had no more value than that serpent of brass. It was to lead their minds to the Savior. Whether for the healing of their wounds or the pardon of their sins, they could do nothing for themselves but show their faith in the gift of God. They were to look and live. Praise the Lord. Look and live, brother. Remember the song. They had ceased to look beyond the symbol to the Signified. In presenting the sacrificial offering, they were as actors in a play. What the word? The ordinances which God Himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. 
walls of partition had been created, just as we create the walls of partition today with our doctrines. And uh, we talk about uh, how we have come into truth on these and that doctrines. But uh, the spirit of such a doctrine is not manifested in us in how we deal with those who are still in that blindness. As, as a person, I know how I struggle and let us turn this thing into something practical. How I struggled with the Trinity thing for 27 years and came to understand the underlying points. And so when I see a brother struggling with the Trinity doctrine, I have been through the same and I know what the brother is struggling in. The least that you can show to such a brother is rebukes, condemnation, and pugilistic languages. And I can say I'm uh, clean. The first two to three years between uh, 2009 to 2013, I was that uh, violent when it came to the doctrine of uh, a uh, one true God. I thought that the people were not seeing this, how much they were blinded. Yes, they are blinded too. But the least you can do is to add what they are going through with another stubbornness on your part for them and create these walls of partition, even refusing to help them when they are in need because they don't believe as you believe. These have created walls of partition. And by the way, this is what has caused even these fellowships among us the General Conference Church to non-Trinitarians. The spirit that is manifested in such a things is not a spirit of those people who have Christ in them. It is a spirit where actually the people have gone beyond looking to Christ and trusting in the doctrine itself rather than having Christ in them. This whole system must be swept away. Whether it be the Jewish system, whether it be the non-Trinitarian movement, whether it be a Trinitarian movement, if Christ is not the center, then the whole of these systems will be swept away. There is no system that will remain standing. Only those in Christ will remain standing. So let us be sober when we deal with these issues, taking the symbol for the substance, but keeping, and how people crucified Christ and hated him more because he broke the Sabbath when actually he didn't break the Sabbath, he was doing good. Deportment in dress, how the dress of others offend us, even when we don't know why they dress the way they dress. And sometimes we go even beyond. We accuse before we even ask the people, have you ever heard about this and that? And what struggles are you going through? Are you having financial problem to buy dresses that can fit you well? Are you having any problem because the society does not accept you because of your dress? Maybe you know you are in a relationship and uh, your man wants you to dress in a short dress and you see that you can't break the yoke of this man and so you have to please him. People are struggling and uh, we have to come close to the people. Remember Christ's method alone in MH 143. Mingle with the people as if he wanted their desires, meet their needs and then bid, bid them follow me. Rarely do we do our series like this. Mingle with the people, know uh, their needs, know what is troubling them. Christ was able to entertain uh, Mary Magdalene seven times and remove seven demons from her. And then she, he bade him follow me. And Mary Magdalene was able to anoint Jesus Christ for burial. She is the only person who understood that Christ needed anointing before he go to the grave because where actually much love has been bestowed, actually much love is shown. But we manifest little love and one results that goes with what we haven't manifested. This series of justification by faith should open up our eyes so that we may understand the underlying points of why Christ has not even come and why our messages are being preached, but they can't produce the necessary character for translation, health and diet, how people have said this and that on health and diet. And I'm not downplaying Sabbath keeping, deportment in dress and health diet. These are necessary if you break them. Whenever you break up these laws, you break all of them. But are these things preached in Christ? Human sexuality, prayer and posture and such like things. 
Be careful, be careful. The Jewish had always prided themselves upon their divinely appointed services. And many of those who had been converted to the faith of Christ still felt that since God had once cleared, clearly outlined the Hebrew man of worship, it was improbable that he would ever authorize a change in any of his specifications. They insisted that the Jewish laws and ceremonies should be incorporated in the rites of the Christian religion. They were slow to discern that all the sacrificial offering had but prefigured the death of the Son of God, in which type met anti-type, and after which the rites and ceremonies of the mosaic dispensation were no longer binding. And we shall be looking at the, the, the issue of everlasting gospel, the two covenants, and how, how the Jewish really misunderstood what the covenants was all about as they misunderstood the law. These are the core issues in 1888, the law, the covenants and the date of Jesus Christ and all this stuff. The Gentiles and especially the Greeks were extremely licentious and, they were, and there was danger that some unconverted in heart would make a profession of faith without renouncing their evil practices. The Jewish Christian could not tolerate the immorality that was not even regarded as criminal by the heathen. This is how they treated their brethren who are coming to the truth. The Jews therefore held it as highly proper that circumcision and the observance of the ceremonial law should be enjoined on the Gentile converts as a test of their sincerity and devotion. This, they believed, will prevent the addition to the church of those who, adopting the faith without true conversion of heart, might afterward bring reproach upon the cause by immorality and excess. The real threat of unnecessary fears. The Jewish converts generally were not inclined to move as rapidly as the providence of God opened the way. From the result of the apostle labors among the Gentiles, it was evident that the converts among the latter people would far exceed the Jewish converts in number. The Jews feared that if the restriction and ceremonies of their law were not made obligatory upon the gender as a condition of church fellowship, the national peculiarities of the Jews, which had hitherto kept them distinct from all the people, other people, will finally disappear from among those who received the gospel message. And so the Jewish people, it, it, it's I, irony that uh, you are preaching to the people to come to accept the truth. And when they're accepting it, you, you, you have these selfish ideas that they will uh, be larger in charge than the original members there. And then the peculiarity will go away. They thought that peculiarity was sacrificial system and circumcision, but yet the peculiarity was them having the knowledge of God and Christ, experientially, that actually made them a peculiar people from other nations. They missed the mark. We miss the mark today. Uh, I'm really uh, coming to light on these issues that were happening in Galatia. We are told, 12,000 young Adventists have been interviewed. And what is it? According to the survey, a mind-blowing 81% of teenagers believe that they must live by God's rule in order to be saved. This is the gospel that has been preached. Furthermore, 62% of them agree that the way to be accepted by God is to try sincerely to live a good life. And 44% believe that the main emphasis of the gospel is on God's rules for right living. Can you imagine? Christ is not in any of this. Nowhere is Christ mentioned, but rules, rules, as if God was a tax master waiting to punish those who doesn't satisfy his righteousness that he needs. The Catholic and evangelical dilemma, Christianity today states in their survey, two out of three, 68% say that a person obtains peace with God by seeking God first, and then God responds with grace. And further, 56% affirm that they must contribute their own personal effort for salvation. And remember, the, the third angel's message in verity is justification by faith. And the work of the enemy is to make the third angel's message of non effective by introducing righteousness by works. This is the sole purpose of the enemy. 
I'd like you to see how the message of righteousness by faith has been uh, ingenuinely uh, inconverted by uh, how Rome has brought in an element, how the purpose meets it is two classes in uh, Great Controversy 572.2. The third angel's message in verity is justification by faith, but uh, the papacy has another element of righteousness or justification by works. Look at it. And this is what is happening in Adventism even right now. Look at GC 572.2. A prayerful study of the Bible will show Protestants the real character of the papacy and will cause them to abhor and to shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. They must have, listen, they must have some means of quietening their conscience and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. That they, what they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering them. Now, this is deep. Men have devised a way of forgetting God, which passes as a method of remembering him. And look at the method. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all this. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world. Those who will be saved by their merits, righteousness by works, and those who will be saved by in their sins. Here is the secret power of the enemy. And so the message of righteousness by faith or justification by faith in verity in the third angel's message is victory over sin that is found in faith in Jesus Christ. So no method is employed of forgetting God as a means of remembering him. But this gospel of no victory over sin and righteousness by works actually is the power of the enemy to blind all the churches. Look at the survey where we are reading about the survey. This is the survey. I have to put it on the screen once again. Two out of three, 68% said that a person obtains peace with God by seeking God first and then God responds with grace. And further 56% are found that they must contribute their own personal effort for salvation. So you are saved by grace, you will be saved in sin, but on the other extreme end, you have to add in personal effort, righteousness by work. It says that the purpose is adapted to meet the wants of these two people. And this is what the evangelicals and Seventh day Adventists are in. Some have found victory over sin so impossible in Adventism that they talk about grace and grace alone. Some have found that actually we must do something to please God and they go to extreme that it is grace plus works. May the Lord save us from this erroneous ideas of justification by faith. These are the people it is often claimed by Adventists who talk about Jesus and his grace too much. What is going on? And so we must go back to the table. The principles carried by the Pharisees are such as are characteristic of humanity in all ages. The spirit of Pharisaism is the spirit of human nature. And as the Savior showed the contrast between his own spirit and methods of those of the rabbis, his teaching is equally applicable to the people of all time. Let us try to wrap up what we are talking about. The Pharisees were continually trying to earn the favor of heaven in order to secure the worldly honor and prosperity which they regarded as the reward of virtue. Faith and works, page 18. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. These are the points that has to be considered. These are the issues in Minneapolis. These are the things that the church has come to face. 
This is the history that we have to go and research, lest we find ourselves repeating it. There are so much errors in our theology, as it were in Galatia. And Paul talks against it so that he goes into the extreme of calling Galatians foolish people. When Paul was compelled to circumcise Titus in Galatians chapter two, verse three, he refused because this was not a means of Titus being accepted in Christ, but this is what the people in Galatia wanted, but he refused. He refused such a, a, a drawings of the people in Galatia, the false brethren that had came to the church. And so as, as we preach about the law, let Christ supersede everything in this because Christ himself is the embodiment of the law. So if Christ is the embodiment of the law, what do we need most? Do we need the law or the embodiment of the law? The embodiment of the law is the, the, the scopus of everything. It is the full dose of everything you need. When you have this embodiment, then it means that in the same embodiment, then it is fulfilled all the righteousness that we need in such a time as this. The gospel that uh, Paul had preached to Galatia was the gospel to liberate them. They just shall live by faith, only faith in Jesus Christ. But false brethren come, came and sneaked in and brought another gospel. When you revisit Galatians 2, 4, we are told false Christians were brought in. If they are false, then they don't belong to Christ. And if they don't belong to Christ, they cannot lead you to Christ. And so unless we ourselves are in Christ and our character can show that, then we don't have a right to go before the people and tell them you shall do this and you shall do that. It is until Christ is manifested in us that we can go to others and tell them about Christ and the law. And what you have been struggling with for many years and the works of the salvation, which are a bondage, will never prepare a church for a harvest. What we need is people to have Christ in themselves. Then the character of Christ can be reproduced in them. And so the gospel, go back and read what was happening in the book of Galatians because we shall come to it uh, next Sabbath once again and uh, deal with it at uh, uh, some point that uh, this made the Galatians go back to the things which were beggarly elements of the world. And uh, what we need is uh, a spirit of Jesus Christ today. And even as Paul received the gospel from Jesus Christ, the gospel he was preaching, we need to drink afresh. We need to drink afresh from the rock of ages, that rock that was in the wilderness. And after drinking of him, he says that let everyone who thirsts come unto me and out of his belly shall flow forth rivers of life. And so after drinking of Jesus Christ, out of our belly shall come rivers of life. We shall be like watered plants besides the rivers. And so Paul talks about the brethren who have thought that they had truth. And when we reach at a point when we find ourselves that uh, there's something we have missed, we have to humble before the Lord. We have to go back to him and ask of his forgiveness. We have to tell him to renew our walk with him once again. And so I'll go through the last slides. In 1888, in the book of Galatians, the controversy in the book of Galatians. When uh, Paul was presenting his ideas, and this is the most important th part as we end it, as we cap it up, let us look at this uh, last sentiment. 
The brethren in Jerusalem showed their connection with God by recognizing the grace that was given to Paul and Barnabas. Those who are moved by the spirit of God will always be quick to discern the workings of the spirit in others. However, the surest evidence that anyone knows nothing personal of the spirit that he cannot recognize his working. Can we see the working of the Lord in our lives? Can people say that they have made Christ in us? Many professed Christian sincere persons suppose that it is almost a matter of necessity that there be differences in the church over little things. And some of the things which are not important, all cannot see alike is the common statement. And after saying that, what follows? Divisions. We must not lose sight of the object of Paul had in mind in referring to the meeting in Jerusalem. It was to show that there was no difference of opinion among the apostles nor in the church as what the gospel is. There was false brethren, it is true, but in as much as they were false, they were no part of the church, the body of Christ, who is the truth. We are told there is only one faith the faith of Jesus, as there is only one Lord. And those who have not that faith must necessarily be out of Christ. If we are seeking to find salvation and uh, acceptance before the Lord in the things we do, Paul was able to disagree with Peter that this is not how salvation is gotten. For being that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And we like to associate with some people and we, we wouldn't want to be associated with some as Peter did in Galatia. And this showed how Peter also misunderstood our acceptance before the Lord. And Paul had to Tell him, my brother, you are wrong. And the other Jewish dissembled likewise with him in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with some dissimulation. Our way of conduct, our way of behavior leads brethren away. When Peter was at the conference in Jerusalem, he told the facts about the receiving of the gospel by the Gentiles through his preaching saying, God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, Acts 15, 8 and 9. Now it reaches in the church of Galatia, and Peter is acting as if he never knew how people are accepted in Christ, withdrawing himself and associating himself with only those of circumcision. Is that this what we repeat? That even if God sends us in a mission somewhere, we will say, oh, no, that congregation believes this, and that congregation believes in that, and such a brethren from there did this, and they did that. And we think that also we can be accepted in Christ. And Paul says, question of justification and salvation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew, live it after the man of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? There are some things we can't even do in our lives, but we will want to force others to do them. Because we think that uh, their acceptance in Christ is measured by our own lives. Same things that we have been defeated to do, we urge them upon others. And so, brothers and sisters, it's a time to review ourselves. There had just been a great controversy over the question of circumcision. It was a question of justification and salvation. Whether men were saved by faith alone in Christ or by outward forms. Peter was caught up with this, a teacher in Israel. We also can be caught up in this. Let he who thinks he's standing take care lest he falls. With the some little truth we have received about uh, the one true God, about the messages we are hearing about justification by faith, about the sanctuary, the law, dress reform, health reform, and all these reforms. Do we come to a point we think that we merit salvation in these things and we see other brethren as a people who cannot be saved? Clear testimony had been born that salvation is by faith alone. And now while the controversy is still alive, while the false brethren are still propagating their errors, these loyal brethren suddenly discriminated against the Gentile believers because they were uncircumcised. The law in Galatians. 
except you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. They were in doubt about the power of faith in Christ alone to save men. And Peter did not make their matters even lighter by the way he behaved, by eating with the Gentiles. And when the Jewish arrived, he went to eat with the Gentiles. You see how we se segregate ourselves. It is a good show. We want to play a good show as actors in a play. Just as the uh, Jewish people, their sacrifices were like an actor in a play. So we, we, we like to put up a face, but miss the whole thing. We really believe that salvation depends on circumcision and the works of the law. Faith in Christ is well, but there is something more to do. It's not in self, it's self-sufficient. We have to add something. This is circumcision. Such a denial of the truth of the gospel, Paul could not endure, and he at once struck directly at the root of the matter. Will we today strike at the root of the matter? May the Lord be with us. And uh, may we be converted afresh to Christ and uh, go outside there with the, the real gospel. The church has been denied the opportunity to hear the gospel and the least you can do is to segregate yourself from those whom you think that uh, they are not of uh, like faith. Try to make opportunities, try to use opportunities to pass this message to others rather than segregate yourself and be in a, a, Panda, a Pandora box and uh, just the problem with the Jewish people and the reason why the temple was burned, when you read about it, is they failed to be missionaries. They, 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 they build uh, walls of partition and they enclose themselves in it. And they thought that they were only the peculiar people and others to be drafted in the head to do this and this. And so may the Lord be with us as even we shall be going on with this uh, truth in the book of Galatians, how the law in Galatians actually was about righteousness by faith and nothing else. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again that uh, you want to speak to us in thy tenderest voice. And Lord, we want to listen to thee. We want to hear Christ speaking in us and not only speaking, but working in us to do of thy own good pleasure. And so may you break like Athen ports, the walls of partition that have been erected by doctrinal differences, by everything that, that does not produce the righteousness of Christ in our lives. Help us to have Jesus inside that we can be able to exemplify him in the outside. And so save us from our own prejudiced and preconceived ideas and impute on us the righteousness and impart on us the power to overcome. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.